Hello and welcome to Chopper's Politics. I'm Christopher Hope, The Telegraph's Associate Editor for Politics, coming to you from my normal bar stool in the Red Lion pub. But this week on the podcast, as MPs are away for their parliamentary recess, I'm also on a short break. So I thought I'd bring you a recent treat that I took part with Telegraph subscribers, our first in-person event for two years. And as we were so excited to be back with listeners again, we thought we'd get our teeth stuck into a difficult topic. The event was titled, How Will History Judge Boris Johnson? A good question to ask, you might think, because we are halfway through what could be Boris Johnson's first or last term as Prime Minister. And to answer that question, I was joined by a panel of people who know the Prime Minister best. First up, we had Andrew Jimson the author of a celebrated biography of Boris Johnson, Boris, the making of the Prime Minister. We had Sir Anthony Selden. Anthony is well known to listeners of this podcast and also as the biographer of 10 Downing Street. He's currently working on a new book about Boris Johnson at 10 out next year. I was also joined by Lucy Fisher, our former deputy political editor, and now at Times Radio as its chief political commentator. And finally, Andrew Bridgen, the Tory MP for North West Leicestershire, a long-time critic of the European Union, who backed Brexit in 2016, and at the time of recording, had put a letter in to Sir Graham Brady, calling for a vote of no confidence in his leader. More on that later. Now, when we started planning this event sometime last autumn, we were pondering what we could discuss about the Prime Minister. We started off thinking we'd be discussing Boris Johnson's next 10 years as Prime Minister. And then in January, when the wheels started coming off over Partygate, we thought it might be mm, 10 weeks. And then on the night of recording, we felt, well, maybe a bit longer, maybe five years. It's worth me saying that this was recorded a few weeks ago, listeners, so your thoughts on this matter may have changed again. But we have to draw a line somewhere. And so, two and a half years into Boris Johnson's tenure, I began by asking my former colleague, Lucy Fisher, this. What is Johnsonism? Well, I think that's a really good question. I think Johnson, the man, the politician, has done well by being a Houdini character. He has charisma, I think we can all agree. He's quite classless, which allowed him to bring together voters from the traditional prosperous Tory shires with many in the red walls of the North and Midlands who'd never voted Conservative before. And that was the magic of him. But when you ask what Johnson is in, is in policy terms, I think it's really difficult to say. It's quite superficial. We've heard a lot of talk about levelling up, haven't we? We've recently had the white paper. I'm a little bit sympathetic to Michael Gove and Boris Johnson in one sense in that the economy has been hit so hard by COVID that there isn't a lot of wiggle room for a lot of spending to really um, boost the North and the Midlands in the way that might have put flesh on the bone of what levelling up is. But if you look past that, you know, he talks tough on immigration. He talks tough on crime. We haven't really seen much on that front yet. There's the culture wars, which, again, play well with parts of the electorate. But I don't think that really there is anything yet, two years in, that really can constitute an ism. Andrew Bridget, you're a Tory MP. What is your... I'm a Conservative, Chris. Conservative MP. I would agree. (laughs) What's your boss believe in? To define Johnsonism is like probably trying to bottle fog. And that's probably that you can draw from it whatever you want. But the fact is, when it comes to voter engagement, I'm... I've never seen anything like it from a prime minister. He, he has that ability. People like him, and he likes people. And I could never say that, in all honesty, about David Cameron or Theresa May. So, well, that's, they, they liked people. Mm, I'm not sure they were very comfortable <laughs> meeting the real people. I'm, to be honest, I'm not really comfortable. I think they were very comfortable meeting me very often, to be honest. So, I mean, uh, Andrew Jimson, you've known Boris Johnson since you were colleagues at The Telegraph. In fact, when, yes. I, when I worked in the lobby room... When I started 2006, you were writing your biography of Boris Johnson. Yes. Is he enjoying being Prime Minister? Most of the time, because he loves being the centre of attention. So, And he's very, very good at being the centre of attention. At sort of, not exactly setting the agenda. Well, he'll try and do that, but at, ma- at giving everyone a story. And if he won't give you the story that you're looking for, he'll give you another story, which is possibly even more amusing. Yeah, so. it, it's odd, isn't it? I mean, he, he, he's a generalist, isn't he? He likes a story. Is that what you need to be a Prime Minister? Well, he's very, very quick at seeing what the story is. And the really difficult thing, both as a politician and 
as a journalist is to know when the story's changed. I mean, any fool can sort of work their way into an orthodoxy. I mean, Lord Salisbury, great, great Tory Prime Minister, said no error in politics is more common than sticking to the carcass of dead policies. And that is not an error that Boris Johnson is likely to make. He cuts and runs. Anthony Seldon, Andrew Jimson, I mentioned Lord Salisbury. Where does Boris Johnson sit in the pantheon of occupants in number 10 Downing Street? Uh, well, Chris, and congrats... I know, I know I, you're a Remainer, so are you I, about I, to go? I, I, <laughs> am I? I we're, was, we're all, le- I we're was, all leavers now, aren't we? I listened we? to Andrew, and now I'm a convinced Brexiteer. Um, <laughs> now, uh, and it's a great timing for the debate, because when we were asked to do it, we all thought that Boris was over, and then along came the telegraph-engineered Ukrainian invasion uh, and to give uh, tonight the, uh, the, the meaning. There is nobody, none of the 54 other prime ministers, who are a bit like him. He is totally, possibly... I don't, ag- I don't agree with that. Actually. OK, well, we'll come back. I think that he is quite special and quite unique. The only one person I think who's like him is Warpole. Why do I think he is uh, like that, Chris? Because great prime ministers are made by great events. And you know, we think, most historians, most biographers, look at the qualities of the individual. People don't make history. History makes people. Churchill was nothing till the Second World War. Lloyd George was a good chancellor, but was made by the First World War. Most prime ministers have maybe one big event. A lot of them don't have any big events. Boris Johnson got a landslide. There have only been 17 landslides in 300 years. He got one of them. He got an epidemic. There have only been three epidemics in British history like that. He got one of those. He got Brexit. Brexit is arguably one of the four or five biggest decisions taken by a government in 300 years. He got that. He's now got a war. If it turns into a world war, there only been two other prime ministers who've had a world war. If on top of all that, the Queen dies on his watch, only nine prime ministers in our history... And they call him uh, lucky. uh, And they call him lucky, Andrew. This man is phenomenal in having the events that make great prime ministers happening on his watch. That's why I think he's he's not like Walpole briefly. Well, the the prime minister who he clearly resembles is Disraeli. Of course, Disraeli is a much bigger name. But Disraeli was the greatest practitioner of Tory democracy. And Tory democracy is an alliance between a loutish section or an unrespectable section of the ruling class and the working class to laugh at the middle class prigs. In, in, those, in those days to laugh at Gladstone, nowadays to laugh at Keir Starmer um, and lots of other people. And, um, and that is one reason why Boris has been very, very successful in the red wall seats, actually. And, and it's a great performance. It's, it's fun. It makes politics amusing, which, whereas the prigs think that politics is, always has to be frightfully, frightfully solemn. Now, Andrew Bridgen, you, you submitted a letter of no confidence in your leader, didn't you? That, you're, one of, you're one of 13... Tory declared. Declared people who have put letters in. One's withdrawn, Douglas Ross, the leader of the Scottish Tory party. Why, why are you being so disloyal to a guy who got you this landslide in, in 2019? Well, I was, I was actually appalled by Partygate. I think it demeaned the government and it let the people down. However, being a pragmatic Conservative and looking at the current situation, I can announce that I'm removing my letter of no confidence in, in the Prime Minister. Right. Uh, we're a pragmatic party at the end of the day, where we are now, it would be so indulgent to have a vote of confidence at a time of international emergency. And this is not going to go away quickly. Uh, it's a long-running crisis, as far as I can see. And we need Boris Johnson where he is leading the country. And it's no time for internecine warfare within the Conservative Party. That only helps Mr Putin and our enemies. And there are plenty of those out there at the moment. And when you put your letter in to, uh, of no confidence to Graham Brady, did you see the PM after that? Did he come and say, Andrew, come on? No, uh, there's a few of the whips snarled at me a bit. But no, no, it's, it's all done through proxies. Yeah. It's, not, it's not direct. So you're hoping to see a minimal post now in the reshuffle with your moment of loyalty to the PM? Well, undoubtedly, I'll be on the party list, won't I? Now, let's look back at some of those themes mentioned, mentioned there so eloquently by Anthony Seldon. Brexit, COVID-19 war in Europe. Lucy, Lucy Fisher, Boris Johnson was elected on a pledge to get Brexit done, wasn't he? Has he? 
Yes, in a word, I'd say yes, he has. And, and in a way, that's also a problem for him because it's led to the question, as, has his usefulness to many of the Tory tribes that backed him primarily for that reason is, is now over. And I don't want to sort of gloss over the Northern Ireland Protocol. That remains a problem. But I don't think it dominates the thinking of most people in Whitehall, let alone the wider country. And so I think he has done that. But I think on the right of the party, people are suspicious of how attractive he finds big state solutions, suspicious of his policy on tax. And certainly the One Nation Conservatives in the centre are very suspicious of him and certainly don't hold him close to their bosom either. So I think it's difficult to place his politics. But I think, you know, that is a big tick for him. He has got Brexit done. It's just everything else that's happened since has taken him on a new new roller coaster. Andrew Bridgen, Lucy's right, isn't she? But Northern Ireland is still in the European Union and uh, that's not great for them, is it? No, and we were hoping to have a, a confrontation with the European Union to resolve all of this. Uh, clearly, international events have... Uh, have taken that was over, triggering taken, Article taken. 16, renegotiating absolutely, the agreement. Absolutely, but I mean, if we were to come to Europe's rescue, both militarily and again, and again, and again, and but also we've got uh, resources in the North Sea, we could start fracking, we wouldn't need to import all our gas, half of our okay, gas from Northern Norway. Ireland is still we would then have a lot of leverage over the European Union okay. when we were selling them a lot of our gas. So we should use gas, of use gas we should. to leverage a deal with Northern No Ireland. one would ever do that to anybody, would they? He would never use leverage. I mean, what's Mr Putin okay. doing to all of us now? Andrew He's Jimson, using his leverage. Andrew Jimson, was Boris Johnson always a Eurosceptic? He always made fun of it, but he wasn't a souverainist. Uh, he wasn't an intellectual descendant of Enoch Powell or at the Daily Telegraph of T.E. Utley. He's not really a proper unionist either, actually. I mean, he had some respect for Delors when he was a correspondent there because he saw that Delors was trying to do something serious and he thought that the French officials in Brussels were much more formidable in those days than the British officials. But he, mo he mocked, didn't he, Brussels out there oh, he mocked all the them, time? Yes, I mean, yes, yes. That, people, yes, he People did, trace yes. back his yes. Brexiteer nature to those articles, didn't they, a lot of the time? Is yes, no, no, that's quite right. And he absolutely won his first reputation by making fun of and, and, and suggesting all these ludicrous regulations. Well, I, I actually spent um, eve of poll on the referendum. Boris came to my constituency, North West Leicestershire, Ashby de la Zouche. We were mic'd up and I actually told him on the day, I said... You do realise we're going to win. And he, he seems genuinely shocked. It is on camera. Yes. And he said, no, it's going to be close. It's going to yes. be close. I said, well, no, we're going to win. He said, well, it's going to be close. I said, well, I ran the campaign for the East Middle. I said, well, not round here, Boris. Don't worry. We're, it's going to be it was yes. 59 41 in the East Middle. Gosh. Yeah. And I was there at the press conference at 10 a.m. next morning with Gove and, and Boris Johnson. Were you the, were you, I was there too. Yeah, yeah, they both looked completely shocked. I agree with they you. Couldn't Green it. to the gills. Oh, I was shocked when, when, when Nigel Farage conceded we'd lost before a vote had been counted. That, that, that shocked me, rather, to be honest. Anthony Seldon, Brexit, your favourite topic. I mean, um, who, huh. who can Boris Johnson lean on? Do you, I mean, you said there's no one, there's, it's one of the five big things that happened to this country. What, what example from, from history can he take, do you think, to, to know whether Brexit, Brexit, he's delivered on Brexit? Is there anything he can look to? Well, I, I mean, he has, Chris, delivered on Brexit after three years of Theresa May trying to get Brexit done, he got it done within six months. He has done it. And the fact of doing it is more important than is it going to be a benefit for Britain or not. That debate will go on for 40 or 50 years. But there is no doubt that he has done it. I think much more pertinent is has he made a success of levelling up? And I think on that, he is going to be judged at the next general election. If he wins the second general election, he will be one of only three Conservative prime ministers who have won Conservative majorities, the others being Salisbury and Thatcher. I mean, this gets him seriously up in the pantheon of great prime ministers. So, so much for all those people who have constantly denigrated him and said, looked at what he can't do rather than what he can do. He is a phenomenon. second big issue of the past two and a half years, Lucy Fisher, has been COVID-19. Now, Boris Johnson was a reluctant lockdowner, wasn't he? But has it been vindicated, do you think? I mean, there was a report out last week which was leapt on by those anti-lockdown people, wasn't it, who said, well, look, you know, we, our death rates were similar to France and Germany. Yeah, I think that is important. Um, and I think that that report actually said it was below the average in Western Europe. 
I think largely people judge these things on how they end in part. And I think that he did make the right call not to lock down, to be one of the earlier countries out of the heaviest restrictions. And of course, the race for the vaccine and the rollout was also very successful. So I think it was a bumpy start. There are still a lot of questions to be answered about what happened in care homes in particular. I think that will be a very sore spot in this kind of decade long inquiry we're going to get. But I think by and large, most populations across the world understand that this was a pretty unique thing to have happened. Everyone was dealing with it in good faith in the best way they can. And in the wash up, that report, the international comparison shows actually Britain's done slightly better than France and Germany. Andrew Bridgen, there was lots of criticism, wasn't there, from Labour about the VIP lane and giving contracts to friends of, of the Yeah, Prime but Minister. if, if Starmer had been in power, Labour had been in power, we would never have come out of the lockdown in the summer. We wouldn't have built up that natural immunity. And we'd have been locked down again for Omicron, where probably, almost certainly, Plan B was no use at all. We didn't need Plan B. We just spent a lot of money we didn't need. And, well, thanks to Mr Putin, COVID doesn't exist anymore. Andrew Jimson, I mean, in a sense, we you kind of just got Brexit done literally six weeks before COVID struck. It's, it's sequential issues here. I mean, do you think catching COVID has in any sense, changed his character. Some have said that it made him more risk-averse. He was a very unsuitable person to deal with a health emergency because he didn't really believe in bad health. And if you were working in an office with him, he would never say, oh, gosh, you, you look terribly ill, you must go home and lie down and, or see the doctor or you know, don't come back until you've recovered. Neither for himself. And you could see that, actually, during the thing. He didn't take it seriously. We saw him looking increasingly ill on these videos. No one... I think Nadine Dorries sort of raised the alarm eventually, as a former nurse. But whether it changed him... It gave him a tremendous opportunity, of course. I think he was at the very pinnacle of his popularity when he thanked the NHS for saving his life. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. And then he, then he didn't give them a pay rise, but let's move on from that. No, he didn't give them a pay rise, but he's made it much more difficult. He's a great stealer of other people's clothes, and it's more difficult for... The, I mean, obviously, the Labour Party will try to say that the NHS is still their issue, as it always has been since Nye Bevan, but it's more difficult for them. Anthony Selden, I don't think you go back to the Black Death in your books, do you? Huh. Has any other previous Prime Minister faced a similar stress about uh, catching COVID during a pandemic? Lloyd, Lloyd George went to Manchester town hall to speak in September 1918, when the First World War was still in a tricky moment before the 100 days had really bitten. And for 11 days, he was touch and go. His private secretary thought that he wouldn't make it. Had he died, then one of his possible successors would have been Churchill, and that would have been a fiasco. So much, you know, Andrew mentioned the point about luck. So much of great premiership is about luck. Churchill became PM in 1940 rather than 1980. Luck and timing. Uh, luck, absolutely. I totally luck agree. And luck timing. and timing. And Boris, who could have become prime minister in 2016, very nearly did, would have been a different prime minister. And maybe it was better for him to have waited till 2019. So Lloyd George is the closest analogy. And he played it extraordinarily well. And I think COVID... On balance, people like Brexit will always argue about it, but he's done well enough, well enough on COVID to sustain him through and give him that push. All those points that I mentioned at the beginning are allowing Boris to react against something that's happened. He's better reacting against the biggest epidemic for 100 years, the biggest war for 70 years. He's brilliant at that. What he's less good at is actually being a cr creative policy maker. And that's why we're not yeah. sure what Johnsonism is, as Lucy Fisher said. Yeah, no, as Lucy said, absolutely. And we, never get, we never get time to see, do we? Because we're always in a crisis. You know, and I don't know the answer to the question. Why did he not, having won that general election in December 19, did he not come back in and start immediately coming in, appointing people like Andy Haldane to, to make levelling up work? But he seemed to... Well, have, we'll, we'll come on to levelling yeah, up, okay, surely. Sure. Uh, just on the point of Brexit, do you think that if he had been Prime Minister in 2016, if he hadn't been knifed by Michael Gove and had... A, I was in the room for that. It was an amazing moment when he withdrew at the end of that long speech. If, if that hadn't happened, do you think in the sense that we needed to have this kind of dreadful two or three years of rowing about Brexit to recognise there was no solution apart from doing it? So actually, the, the circumstances in 19 were better for him than in 16. Unknowable, counterfactual, but always interesting... I think his charisma would have done it. And what Theresa May, who had many qualities as a prime minister, but not the quality of leading a country through that. Well, 16 decision. to 19 also gave Nigel Farage the chance to be 
UKIP Brexit party to be the entry drug for Labour voters to come to the Conservatives. Uh, we needed that. gave that. you the Red Bull seats. Lucy Fisher, on, on to you, the big issue of the day. Ukraine, the PM had had five hours off midnight to 5am about three weeks ago on Thursday morning between, between the rules ending in England and Putin invading Ukraine. Do you think the PM has done well so far? He's shown, I mean, a lot of PMs, like when they're being threatened on security grounds, they do step up, Theresa May did over the Salisbury attacks. Mm-hmm. The PM has done the same with Ukraine? Yeah, I think he has done well uh, on Ukraine. Again, I think he's been lucky that he seems to have this personal rapport with Zelensky. In a sense, they're both court gestures. Why wouldn't they kind of get on? I think also I'm told by sort of security contacts that the Ukrainians fear that the Americans will be much more likely to sell them out to the Russians. They're really banking on building this link with the UK to try and make sure that any eventual deal that's reached isn't something that throws them under a bus. But I think Boris Johnson's got the optics right. He's been out to RAF airfields, glad-handing pilots, taking over vital supplies. The UK was early on to the dangers of what was going on with Russia. When you look back at the countries that were arming Ukraine, we've had a defence operation since 2015, Operation Orbital, to try and train up Ukrainian 22, forces. 22,000 have gone through that. We've trained 22, Yeah, 22,000. I mean, that, that's amazing. You know, and all the weaponry that's been sent... There's a sense that the UK was ahead of the curve compared with a lot of the the rest of, of Europe. I think where it's been weak is obviously on trying to help get refugees from the crisis to the UK. I think the the slowness that the Home Office has acted has, has been they bad. They blame security issues. But, but, Andrew Bridgen, did but you, in, do you buy in, that? In, in, in def- well, we are further away from where they're crossing the border. Clearly, a lot of those people are only half families. The men have stopped to fight. It's mostly women. They can't leave the country. No, they can't leave the country. Uh, mostly women and children. And they are, will want to mostly, but they want to go home. And I think in defence of the government, and I don't always do that, as you may know, we are the biggest donor of humanitarian aid. And some of the countries these evacuees are moving into, like Moldova, is the poorest country in Europe. They can't support hundreds of thousands of, of people coming in from the Ukraine without the UK's help. And that's yeah. really important. Uh, Andrew well. Jimson, the, the Boris you knew when you first started writing your book, did you ever thought he'd be a war leader? Not particularly, no. Because He the, channels the, that. He, he wrote his biography of Churchill. He knows what to do. What to do? I well, suppose. he does make the connection with people. He was very, very good, I thought, with the woman from Ukraine at his press conference in Warsaw. They organised it quite tightly. I think there's only going to be one Polish question and one British question. But he saw that this woman was very anxious to speak, and she spoke at considerable length. She was more or less weeping by the end of her thing, and he had a rather harrowed look because he did listen. He did enter into why she was so worried and felt so let down that the West weren't doing enough. But he is a caring man, isn't he? he yes. He, he, is a, a, I mean, he has that, uh, that way of emoting with someone. His critics are usually in, right, but he does have whatever fault that they've identified. But they're wrong to think that's the whole truth about him. He has other, there are other things about him which they become incapable of seeing because they get so hung up on their denunciations. They get so angry, in fact. He's very good at making people, or a certain kind of person, very tremendously angry with him. And they can't then cease to think straight. But actually, what I'm very pleased about this evening, I think it's very great to see that Andrew Bridgen has been reprogrammed and he's now giving the the Downing Street... um, (laughs) The Downing Street line. I wonder what this... If if you you wonder what Downing Street is thinking, just ask Bridgen. He's seeing what he's told. Anthony Selden, the the Churchill factory, was that in fact the name of his book, I think, for memory, but the the, the Churchill, is that an overdone cliche with Boris Johnson? Is there a different leader we should be looking back to? He clearly is deeply moved by Churchill. Churchill had a love of language, not classics as in Boris's case, but the great writers in the English pantheon. And that sense of of language, that sense of history, the ability to communicate to ordinary people outside political circles are very similar. It would have been absurd two months ago to say there were similarities. Most people would have jeered and scorned in the way that people love to jeer and scorn. But there are similarities. When I asked him on a programme, BBC programme, on that book, 300 Years of British Prime Ministers, who he'd most like to have dinner with, he said, Gladstone. Uh, And that was uh, surprising and probably mischievous. But I take the point about Disraeli. There are lots of similarities with Disraeli also. And I think going back to Walpole, I mean, Walpole and he were so alike. Not just did they go to the same 
school. They both moved into number 10 with women 25 years younger than them. They both nearly died in their first year in office. They both caught the epidemic. They were both nearly scuppered by the Scots, which we haven't really mentioned uh, very much. Their both chances, both larger than life, both only came into office because of a crisis, South Sea bubble, Brexit. But, and I completely agree with Andrew, that people have looked too much at what's wrong with him. And we can all make a list of five sheets of paper about the things that he doesn't have. But actually, it's the things that he does have. And look, I, as you said, I didn't agree with Brexit, but Brexit was a massive thing for a prime minister to have done and took extraordinary gall. And he was the person who knew that he was going to bring back Cummings to make that happen. And without Cummings, it wouldn't have happened. He'd observed Cummings during the referendum campaign. He'd seen Theresa May not do it. He knew he needed to have somebody with savage political guts to make it happen. And, you know, that is the stuff of history, whether we like it or not. Now, I'm going to whiz through some of the other, the less good points about Boris Johnson's time in PM so far. Partygate. Lucy Fisher, is it now a Westminster indulgence? Or will he resign? I'll ask Andrew Bridge in a second if he's fined by the police. No, I don't think he will resign. And I also think he's through the danger. I think even without Ukraine, he's a master of throwing things into the long grass. And eventually, things lose impetus. Anger fades, it dissipates. I'd already heard people beginning to get angry at the media, sort of, you know, propagating this, the story longer than people wanted to hear about it. Andrew Bridging, we're out of the COVID restrictions, but if he does receive a fixed penalty notice, that's a, it will be a criminal sanction. Will you put your letter back in? Will you dig it out of the bin? We'll have to, <laughs> we'll have to consider that at the time. I don't think there's any way that Boris Johnson will quit. I don't see the police report coming through any time soon. But when it comes, should it he go if he's found guilty? That will depend on colleagues in the Conservative Party. And you. And me. And what will you do? I'll judge the situation then as I see it. And the, the difference will be, I mean, if the public have not forgiven and forgotten, then the Conservative Party will reap badly. So it's timing. Elections. If Ukraine dies down, it happens in July, it could be a different picture, could it? As a parliamentary party, it would appear that we're quite happy to potentially sacrifice a lot of councillors in May, who um, they will be the canaries for what we may to have looked forward to in okay. 2024. I'm just coming back on the, on the point of, 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 of Boris. My, my friends of mine who are unfortunate to still live in countries who are in the European Union, they say to me they're very jealous of British politics because whenever you have a crisis, you have a leader emerge whether that's Churchill or Thatcher, who turns it round for you. And, you know, whether Boris Johnson is going to, to join that league will be decided in the next six, eight months, I think. Andrew Jimson, did Partygate surprise you that parties were happening on his watch when he was Prime Minister? Let's not go there whether he's at a party or not, that's a police matter. But the fact that parties happened on the eve of the funeral of the Duke of Edinburgh when he was in Chequers is a bad look, no, obviously. Well, it's a bad look, but he wasn't there. He wasn't there on that occasion. Yeah, but it um, happened and he's in charge. Right? But I'm not surprised that rules were broken. Because he's he, rule breaker, isn't he? Of course, and we knew that long before he became Prime Minister. So the Tory tribe knew what it was getting and decided that they'd rather have him than Jeremy Hunt in the, in the final round. And Jeremy Hunt palpably would be much less likely to have broken a single rule and, or to have had any Prosecco sort of in the suitcase or in the fridge or wherever it was. Yeah, so I, this is Andy Selden. I, mean. I, I think a much bigger issue, Chris, is going to be can he sort out the cost of living? I think that's going to be massive for him coming up once Ukraine is over. Absolutely. And we've got half the population have never seen inflation rates that we're going to see. They're going to be a lot so, of okay, so, so on that, on broken manifesto promises, you fought a, a campaign in 2019 on not increasing national insurance. That is going up in April. I didn't vote for it. In, back, in, back in September? Yeah. You, you abstained or you voted against? Uh, no, you abstained, right? Abstained. Not the same. You, voted, you, you, let, you let it happen, OK? It went through on your watch. How are you going to face the people in North West Leicestershire on break, breaking that promise? Well, let's see what Rishi is going to... The, how many rabbits out of how many hats he can pull out in oh, other right. areas. Uh, there's got to be measures to reduce the burden of energy prices, yeah. uh, VAT, green taxes, all these things. But the answer is those are measures to mitigate. People need hope. And the hope is that we don't mind how bad it is today as long as it's better tomorrow. And the hope is we are going to authorise the drilling in, in the North Sea. We do need to get fracking. We probably need to get that coal mine going for our coking coal 
Yeah, and just ignoring the question, uh, Anthony Selden, the, 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 the manifesto said we will not raise the it's rate of answer, income. Though. Well, not really. No, the, 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 we will not raise the rate of income tax, VAT, or national insurance. They did on national insurance. How common is it for PMs to break manif manifesto promises as big as that on page two of the manifesto? Not common at all. And where it happens, they're often punished, but I'm not certain he's going to be punished because of all the other noise around. But it's incredibly difficult now because he's being pushed in a wokish direction. He's going in a Macmillanite, Disraeliite, one nation direction. And that's not what the voters who made that landslide happen, as we were hearing earlier, that's not what they want. And how do you get through that inconsistency? That's the real crunch. And can he get a number 10 team that will be stable enough to drive it through that won't last two uh, days. Andrew Jimson, is Broken Promises part of Boris's stick? Oh, I wouldn't particularly put it like that, but of course he fights a war of movement. And I, th he, I think he realises that actually the, the, the politics has changed. And this very naive idea of, of a certain kind of... I mean, Margaret Thatcher was an absolutely great woman who, of course, the taxes went up in the 1981 budget. But these Conservatives who thought that conservatism, the whole essence of it, the whole of this great and complicated and rich tradition could be reduced to some paltry economic theory and you just have the free market and then everything, life is, we live, all live happily ever after. It's a completely naive idea of conservatism and it's certainly not his idea of conservatism. Lucy Fisher, just looking forward to the next two and a half years of Boris Johnson, it, it, what's he need to do? I mean, levelling up is the challenge, isn't it? Anthony Selden mentioned Scotland. That's the canary in the mine because if Nicola Sturgeon does force a vote on the union by the middle or the end of next year, there could be a problem. What's he, what's he need to do now? Well, there could be. I mean, when you look at the polling at the moment, I feel appetite is waning in Scotland for independence. And he doesn't need, like Labour, do need Scottish seats to win. He doesn't need those. He can consolidate within England. I mean, that does lead to criticism, potentially. He's, he's a prime minister for England and, and England alone. But I think the really huge problem is the economy. And I personally don't think it's a problem, given the extraordinary circumstances he's had to react to, that he has broken the tax lock. What I do think is a problem is the rationale for doing that, that there'll be £12.5 billion extra a year to cut NHS waiting lists and to reform the social care system. After, three, year, after three years, yeah. After three years. And that isn't going to happen. I mean, it's, it's not enough money. That's a pretty disastrous situation. When have we ever got money back out of the NHS? Well, I think the NHS is going to be a massive electoral issue. And, and the general cost of living, I just think, with grocery bills going up, obviously energy, um, household bills soaring. Andrew Bridgman, who I should be leader of your party next election? Struggle to catch Boris up for, for energy costs for businesses, which don't even have a, have a cap. Um, it, 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 that's the, the, that's the issue. Liz Truss? Not, not for me, not for my taste, to be honest. She's a lovely lady. But if Boris gets through the next six months, um, he, he'll be leading us into the next general election, I think. Because the election is May 24, and they cut, they're running yes. out of time to change leader. Can I ask Andrew a question? Not to do your job no, for no, you, you Toffer. Um, they're you think... coming at me from all sides now. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, everyone on the panel, I'm, I'm interested in the question of whether you think that there could be civil unrest due to cost of living. I don't think we're that way inclined in this country. Um, it will be a shock for half of our population, the younger population, who've, who've not seen anything like these inflation rates. And it could get into double digits quite easily, depending on on how long problems go on in, in Ukraine. So I, don't, I hope not, um, but it is going to be an eye-opener for a lot of people. I'm watching the clock for our other, other questions in this room and down, down the line. Andrew Jimson, quickly, do answer Lucy, Lucy's question. Can I ask you also, how long does he want to be Prime Minister? He's told friends I th I th he wants, I think, to, he I wants think, to beat Cameron. Cameron was, I, th was I think not, not longer than 20 years, I think. <laughs> not longer than 20 years, yeah. if he gets a chance. But he wants to beat Cameron. He'll never want to stop There's them. There very, very, very few of them do. So. Yep, yeah, six and a half years is David Cameron. He wants to beat that. that would, oh, yes. Yes, no, he, he, well, of course he wants to win the next election. and Late 2025 and then resign? I mean, Dominic no, Cummings says he'll go after two years in the next... Well, um, be, he'll find some... I mean, of course, Margaret Thatcher found the poll tax as a new mission. He, 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 the, whatever new mission he finds. But then the, and these short-term economic difficulties, which are very severe, but there'll be a lot of boosterism. There'll be a lot of, you know, we're going to build a nuclear power station here or we're going to do something else there. So that, that will be intended to sort of throw the story forward and show that the government is getting... And he will fight next so year. So he won't just sort of sit there while interest rates go up and everything. 
you won't sit and wait, wait for it to hit him. He'll do things. And he'll fight the next election as far as Oh, you yes, I think so. I mean, of course, the politics is so totally unpredictable, he might yes. be thrown out tomorrow. And that's a very good thing. This is a free country. We can always sack whichever rascal is in charge. When the, when the people are scared of the politicians, that's tyranny. When the politicians are scared of the people, that's democracy. And that's Absolutely. Here, here. Anthony Seldon, finally to you. If you're writing his obituary for the Telegraph, what's the first line? Is it Brexit? Is it COVID? Is it Ukraine? Something else? Is it Partygate? It would be shock horror. The Telegraph and asking me to write. I <laughs> never thought that day would. Uh, no. it, it, it would be, uh, we won't see his like in our time again. And what's the first line? Is it, what's his big achievement, the crowning achievement of the first two and a half years of Boris Johnson's time in government? Uh, making Brexit happen, getting the country through coronavirus and getting the country through this terrible, shocking uh, war in Ukraine. If you're finding this podcast interesting, you may also like our new daily podcast, Ukraine, the latest. Every weekday, The Telegraph's leading journalists bring you the latest news and the most informed analysis of President Putin's invasion of Ukraine. From our newsroom in London and from the ground. The Russian machine has been ground to a halt now for well over a week, and that is just staggering. NATO has to act now. It has to do more than it's currently doing. Otherwise, in this Ukrainian MP's words, you'll have to evacuate the whole continent. One video that we found to be incorrect was bomb squads seen in the Donbass region. The metadata of this clip shows that it was created in 2019, not today. Search Ukraine the latest in the same place you're listening to this and click follow so you don't miss an update. Right, we have now got time for questions. The gentleman there, please. Thank you. Um, going White House, I'm just an ordinary Telegram subscriber. I was struck by Andrew's comment that he said we, he didn't think this country was one for civil unrest due to hardship. And then not very long after that, the other Andrew, I think it was, threw in the words, the poll tax. Oh, yeah. and, I, and I just wondered whether really Andrew B was really quite so confident that if fuel is going to go up, the amount it is, and food prices are going to go up, is he really quite so sure that there aren't going to be people on the streets demoing? Andrew. Well, there's a difference between demonstrating and, and violent demonstration. If that, I think we need to make that that clear. I'm, I'm all for people demonstrating for causes they believe in, but I think we're intimating that there was going to be violent demonstrations. As someone who was brought up in a coal mining area who worked and we went through the coal mining strike, we saw plenty of, plenty of that when I was at school, I can, I can tell you. Um, I, I, well, we've got a culprit to blame for it. It's, it's, it's all Mr Putin's fault, isn't it? And we're going to hammer him relentlessly. Well, a question here online from uh, an unnamed watcher. Is Boris Johnson, as Prime Minister, just the latest manifestation of the lack of greatness in public life in the 21st century? A lot of people say to me they're deeply unimpressed by the Cabinet, Anthony Seldon. Do you agree there's a, there's a quality issue? Well, it's not uh, Harold Wilson's Cabinet or Clement Attlee's Cabinet or Margaret Thatcher's Cabinet, but there are people who are rising and looking surprisingly good, including uh, most recently the Defence Secretary. So let's just give them a little yeah. bit of time to, to grow and mature like wine. And I think the question about Boris Johnson, we were, we were just, everybody heard the downside about Boris Johnson and the fact that he's no good at detail, that, he, that his private life, that he doesn't uh, understand, doesn't read, etc., those are important, but they are not all important for a prime minister. Actually, most prime ministers have gone wrong precisely because they've lost the sight of the big picture, what they were in politics to do. And they just become, you know, being prime minister is it's ridiculous. The pressure on you every day just to get through to the end of the day, see everybody you've got to see, read all the papers, do the stuff. And most of them lose the plot. Boris, because he's not so interested in the detail, doesn't really care about, you know, uh, about that. He's got the big picture. The question is, whether, can he do it with levelling up? I think that's the big question. Yeah, Andrew Jimson. Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> One. Is there a lack of, of greatness in public life and Boris Johnson well, manifest, I, manifest that? I, I follow politics very carefully 
as a schoolboy in the 1970s, and it seemed that was a very humiliating decade because Heath made a mess of it, uh, and his many members of his cabinet didn't seem very impressive. And then, and then Harold Wilson made a mess of it, and then Callaghan had the winter of discontent at the end of his time. And the Germans had Mercedes, and we had British Leyland, which had been bodged together by... I mean, a, a number of great British motor companies had all been bodged yes. together by the politicians. And, and, okay. and, and you had sort of but touch, in the 21st touch trouble as you drove out of the garage. I mean, it was, a, yes. it was, it was very so it's bad. worse in the 70s. And, and, and I rather liked the power cuts and stuff. But again, <laughs> it seemed that the Germans, the Italians, the French, the Japanese were all doing things better than we were. So I, I think that we're in a... I think, I hope, I mean, who knows? Something terrible may happen tomorrow, but I hope we're more resilient now. And it seems as interesting that our labour market does seem to work, actually. Yes. And it didn't work properly in the 70s. There was a terrible trade union problem, very bad management as well. And I think we're more resilient now and more capable we're of We're still living on Mrs Thatcher's legacy, you say? Perhaps. Lucy Fisher, there's a question here from um, someone online. Do you think that some of the cabinet are letting the PM down? Do you think there's a bit of a moderate level of greatness in the cabinet? No, on balance, I think it's probably it's a temptation to be nostalgic and look back at the past with rose-tinted glasses when it comes to competence. Where I do think there is an issue with this Downing Street cabinet is on ethics and standards. I think mm. that that is a noticeable difference to, to recent years and recent Conservative Prime Ministers, David Cameron, Theresa May. I, I think that there are question marks about some cabinet members. I think immigration is something that matters a lot to Conservative voters, to, to voters generally, where Boris Johnson has been lucky in a way that the crises that have overtaken him repeatedly have mm. um, masked some of the, the lack of grip on that. Do you and blame Priti Patel or the Home Office or both? Well, I think that um, he hasn't been strong enough to, to move her yet, and she has her own sort of fan base within the party. But I do think that that is an issue that he'll want to see grip before the next election because it could quickly spark up again. Andrew the Bridget. Channel Crossings are a running yeah, sword small boats, in yeah. every every Conservative MP's inbox, and it is being masked out now by, by greater events. But when those events subside, that will then yeah. become a huge issue again. A further question from our, our viewers online. Do you think Boris Johnson might be judged by how much he could level up? And if he doesn't, the red wall, the blue wall may crumble in the, in the 2024 election. Well, we've only got um, just over two years to the next general election, probably. And how much, if, if we start now, how much will that levelling up actually deliver? It's going to have to be hope, because it's not going to be substance. Because there isn't even time for all this to go through and, and for people necessarily to feel a, a material difference. But they've got to feel it, it, is, it is really coming. It is hope that sustains. Hope does indeed sustain. <laughs> uh, who's someone at the back there? Yes, please say who you are, sir. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Tom, one for uh, um, Sir Anthony Selden. Um, how far are great prime ministers or great leaders defined by external events? Mm. How does that reflect on Johnson? Has Putin saved him? Great question, Tom. Uh, so, so, Tom, you know, I think it's a mixture in the book. Andrew and I, who also wrote, wrote a great book about prime ministers, differ slightly about who the top prime ministers were. But I had nine, and it, for many it was foreign wars, like Churchill, like Lloyd George, and like uh, Palmerston. But for others, Attlee, I mean, the creation of the welfare state was an astonishing domestic achievement. There was a very creative prime minister who managed to have a clear agenda. You need to have that, either one that you create yourself as Attlee did, or one that's created for you when there is a foreign crisis or an epidemic or a, a downturn. Gordon Brown, not a great prime minister, but was a better prime minister because of the global financial crisis. His premiership was going nowhere, and he was lucky that the crisis on his watch was one that he was good at. Theresa May was unlucky because the crisis on her watch, the, having that big vision of understanding Europe and how to get public opinion behind you, she couldn't do. So I think a mixture, but I think at the end of the day, great leaders are made by the great events, but they have to react to them well. I mean, a North, who, who yes. Andrew's written about in his book, had a great event, the American War of Independence, and he got it wrong. Yes. So having a great event of itself is not a... It's a necessary, yes. but not a sufficient... But don't they say but that, Prime Minister, you either mould events 
in, uh, in you. although yeah. they shape you, yeah. or you're buffeted by them, and yeah. no one wants. Andrew Jim, so you've written a book too, haven't you, about Trump and the yes. Prime Ministers, as well as uh, Anthony? What's your Most answer, people Tom? can only remember. We can usually only remember one thing about a Prime Minister, if that, and it, it's very often something which went wrong. So it's Chamberlain and, and appeasement. Chamberlain, a big figure domestically. It's Eden and and Suez. Poor old Lord Aberdeen isn't really remembered now, but he got us into the Crimean War, and he was a great sort of foreign policy expert, and he hated war, but he didn't make it clear to the Russians that there was going to be real trouble if they did various things, and they did do various things, and then there was a war. And, of course, since Waterloo, we thought that the British Army was invincible. In fact, it wasn't. It was total, total catastrophe, all reported through the telegraph system. And so the nation said, we've got to have Palmerston. And Palmerston was then 70 years old, the oldest that any Perman became ever became Prime Minister for the first time, but the nation knew that he was the man. And that's why there are still lots of pubs called the Lord Palmerston, mm. because the na- he somehow resonated with are the Are you nation. saying there might be some Boris Johnson pubs in 10 years' time? <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Well, yeah, I think there might be, actually, yes. <laughs> yes. And the question at the back, who's there? Um, hello, my name's Clara Cromberg. You spoke about Boris's main achievements in office, and I just wondered what his main failure would be if you had to pick one. Single failure. We'll ask the whole panel that one. Single failure, Anthony Selden. Uh, I think it will, for the reason that Andrew said, the time frame on levelling up, the promise that he was going to make it better for the whole country, there wasn't time to do it. He can blame... Putin, he can blame COVID, but at the end of the day, hitting with the fuel price increase, cost of living in those areas, you know, people vote because of their sense about themselves and their families. Are we better off? And most of them won't be. They'll be worried. Leveling up, one failure. Not you can't. Well, I you think, can't I think what the Anthony total said. confusion for uh, for month after month in number ten, not getting a grip on that. It is. Thank it you. is not getting on with leveling up straight away, despite COVID. And I could see some sharp spinner saying, you know, in the north of England saying, yes, you have levelled us up. Our prices now are over expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy Fisher, similar? I think it's wider than just levelling up. I think it's a lack of any policy vision and getting a grip when he came in. I think he outsourced too much of the thinking to Dominic Cummings. And some of his ideas could have worked. The idea of making Britain a science R&D superpower yes. or you know, slashing you know, bonfire of the red tape to make us a Singapore, making economic use of some of the Brexit freedoms. There are lots of avenues he could have gone down, but there was a lack of grip and, and levelling up was was part of the victim of that. Like, There's a question here from online. Boris Johnson, of course, is an American citizen, isn't he? Although he's renounced that, that, um, that citizenship, I think, to be Prime Minister. Will he succeed, you think, Lucy Fisher, in creating a special relationship with the USA, despite the kind of liberal nature of the Biden administration? Lucy, first. No, um, I, I think... No, because Biden is too caught up with domestic policy. And you can see from the fact it took him more than a year to even come up with a nomination for the US ambassador to the UK, who's Jane Hartley, who's not yet confirmed. He got Ireland done. He got some other sort of key nations done. It just shows that Britain isn't a priority for Biden. Andrew Jimson. Uh, Boris hates the term special relationship because he thinks it makes us sound needy. So he won't use that that expression. I think he has an affinity with the Americans and he realises that any British Prime Minister is, is your duty to be whether it's Trump or Biden you have to try and get on with them and I think he'll, he's quite good at getting on with people. He doesn't in this very insecure way pretend it's all about whether the President has sort of rung you or something he makes time to see to see the Swedish Prime Minister or the Dutch Prime Minister, he's not sort of grand about it. And this, and this actually probably makes him more value to the Americans anyhow. And, and Chris, the times a special relationship has worked best is where you have a strong man in the White House and a strong man in number 10. So Churchill, Roosevelt, Thatcher, Reagan, Bush, uh, Blair. You know, it doesn't work with Biden. He's not strong enough. No. There's a man in the Czech shirt with a question. Hi, yeah, I'm Elliot Tyler. We had some good news about Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe. Yeah, Johnson was blamed in part for the delay in her returning home. And I was wondering if this, in your view, is going to taint his, um, his record. You know, the fact that uh, he made a big mistake that had a big consequence. Lucy Fisher, he, he, he misspoke, didn't he, to the Foreign Affairs Committee about what she was doing in Iran. 
back now, that does, does resolve an issue for him, which is a big problem. Yeah, it does. I, I think there was a lot of concern about his stint as Foreign Secretary. Andrew, interested to hear your view. It seemed a lot of Conservative MPs' confidence in Boris Johnson as a serious politician was undermined. He made a whole range of foolish comments, talking about you know climbing over the dead bodies in Seat and Syria. Training Libya. journalists, things that were illegal in the country. Yeah, exactly. I, I, so I think it's, it was one of a number of missteps. In this particular instance, it has come good that it's been resolved it's, and thankfully she's yeah, and, 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 and as all political matters, as we've already said, all's well that ends well and, and this is a good ending. It's very much like COVID, the vaccinations. We had some dodgy times in it, but it's, it's, at the end it'll be judged on how it ended and, and you'll, you'll always swap politically a bad start for a good end. I think it was impossible for Boris to be a successful foreign secretary because the most important relationship, the relationship which really has to be special for a British foreign secretary, is with the British Prime Minister. And the British Prime Minister made jokes about Boris Johnson. And so, and, and if, if the Prime Minister, and obviously he's completely shut out of the Brexit, Anthony, it's impossible Anthony, to be a good, good, Anthony, good uh, foreign secretary. So uh, what I'd say, Chris, is that one of the most striking things that we haven't talked about is his louche private life, but it does seem that some of the greatest prime ministers, not all, some like Thatcher, some like Churchill, were impeccable, yes. or almost impeccable. But, no, but, 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 not, uh, but not Walpole, not Lloyd George, okay. and not Palmerston. And I think that, I, I look, I don't think it was a big issue. It's convenient for him, but he's got far bigger issues. And it's a great, it's a great thing that they're back uh, uh, and you know and that's of course uh, happiness and celebration. I'm going to ask you along the panel with the final question. We came here with this question in mind. How will history judge Boris Johnson? That's the question. Lucy Fisher. How? I think it's I think well we've all You can't say too early to say. Well we've been reflecting on the fact you know the ending it plays such a huge part in colouring how a whole stint is viewed. I think it seems everyone on the panel has agreed it's likely that Boris Johnson will lead the party into the next election. It's pretty difficult as far as I can see with the electoral maths for the Conservatives not to be the largest party coming from an 80-seat majority. So I think there's a long way to go. But as Anthony said, he's already come up against so many unique circumstances. There is a sort of greatness already in, inherent in his mm, premiership okay. two years in. Andrew Bridgen. Well, I think several times in, in Boris Johnson's career, we've probably thought we were reading the final chapter and then all of a sudden the story lifts again and it leads on. And so the final chapter has not been written. Uh, it, it may be written in six yeah. months' time, it may be written in 12 months' time, it might not be written for 10 years' time. Will he be a great Prime Minister? Um, Two years in. He has the potential to be because events okay. uh, have come along which were unprecedented. You're both writing books on him. Andrew Jimson. I think the greatest communicator of his, of his time, I mean, obviously people like Farage and Alex Salmon uh, indeed Nicholas Surgeon, all good communicators, but I think he had a remarkable ability actually to to take people with him in the referendum campaign and in, the, and, in, and in various elections. Who knows what will happen in the next one? But. Andy Selden, you've written loads of books about Number 10 and its occupants. How will history judge Boris Johnson? Oh, as a big, big player, and if he does stay on, and by the way, I'm not certain he will uh, still be there because Number 10 just, you know, when somebody's strong, you think they'll always be strong. When they're mm. weak, you think they'll never, ever make it back up. I'm not certain he will because of unforeseen things, but he has this extraordinary Houdini ability to get over it. But if he does win that general election, Chris, I mean, look at that. That's Churchill, that's Salisbury, two consecutive general elections. I mean, that is historic on top of everything else. So we'll look back at him as a very significant person. Well, I do hope you enjoyed that discussion, listeners. I certainly did. We are hoping to host more live Choppers Politics events and we'll keep you posted about how to come to them if you want to. If you want to get in touch with me about Boris Johnson's legacy, please do email me, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or tweet me, I'm at Choppers Podcast. Thank you to my panel, Andrew Jimson, Sir Anthony Selden, Lucy Fisher and, of course, Andrew Bridgen MP. Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wales, Giles Gear, Isabel Bougiard and Theodora Luludis. And thank you too to Lanra Kerrigan and Jade Clark who produced the live event. And of course, thank you to you for listening. I'll be back, God willing, next week with more excellent interviews from the Red Lion Pub and Westminster. Please do tune in. 
And as always, please do buy a copy of The Daily Telegraph if you can. You won't regret it. Until next time, though, cheerio.